Hey everybody, welcome to another Rackspace Office Hours live stream. My name is Alan Bush and we're broadcasting live from the castle, our headquarters here in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I'm here with uh, Bert Varela and a couple of other folks and we're going to be talking a little bit more about fleet management today. Let's get everybody introduced real quick and then we'll jump in and talk about our topic. So uh, I'm Alan, that's Bert. How you doing Bert? Hey Alan. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Glad, glad to have you along. We've got uh, Drew Cox, one of our usual co-hosts here joining us. Hello. And then we've got Nicholas Keekler down there at the end. How you doing, Nick? Good. How are you guys? Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Well, we're really excited to put this panel together to uh, talk a little bit more in depth about fleet management. We had a couple of guests on, oh, what was that, about two, three weeks ago, Drew? Yeah. And we talked about fleet management. We really, we really looked at the way that that uh, interfaces with our customers, right? So we're kind of uh, peeling this onion uh, down a little bit closer to the data center. I guess in a couple of weeks we'll have some people on from our DC Ops team to, uh, to round this all out to talk about uh, how they manage everything there. But uh, no, today we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about how they manage our fleet. Um, this is our uh, in-studio guest. Those of you that are watching on Facebook and Periscope, hey, uh, good to have you watching along with us. Uh, you guys are seeing everybody uh, here in the studio, but you won't hear the voice of our next guest, Matt Van Winkle. Uh, and he's joining us live from the OpenStack Developer Summit, uh, or the Operator Summit in, uh, in New York uh, today. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook and Periscope and want to see everybody, you can head over to live.ohpodcast.com and see everything there. But uh, let's go ahead and bring in Matt and say, hey, Matt, how you doing? Hey, guys, I'm doing great. How are you all? Oh, it's super, super. Glad to uh, have you uh, joining us uh, from OpenStack. And, uh, uh, happy gonna... to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. We're, well, we're glad to have you. Uh, Matt, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, who you are, how long you've been a racker, and what you do uh, here at Rackspace. Uh, sure. So, uh, as you said, my name's Matt. Um, most folks at Rackspace actually call me B-Dub. It's been a longstanding uh, nickname. I'm not exactly sure how it started. Um, I am the senior manager of operations uh, with our public cloud servers, uh, which basically means I really work for Bert and Nick most of the time and, and take care of whatever they tell me to take care of. So um, it's just a, it's a nonstop uh, excitement, I think, in solving hard problems and coming up with unique ways to manage uh, large-scale infrastructure. So it's, it's really fun. Well, great. Well, we're, we're glad to have you joining us, and uh, I know that you're going to be busy the rest of the day and probably tomorrow as well with the uh, mid-cycle there, and I, I know you're going to be uh, sharing a lot and bringing a lot back, so glad to uh, glad to have you join. Um, Bert, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Tell us about uh, you, yourself as a racker and kind of uh, what you do around here. Yeah, sure, Alan. Um, I'll be actually starting, I, I want to say I've started my ninth year here, and oh, so wow. I've had a chance to see uh, some of the uh, stages that Rackspace has gone through um, in those intervening years. Um, a while back when we uh, were looking at the uh, whole public cloud thing, um, it garnered my interest and um, I decided to take a chance with it and, and it's had my attention ever since. Um, as Matt mentioned, um, it's definitely uh, nonstop excitement. Um, but uh, right now, uh, my current role is um, I'm helping manage the operations team that mm -hmm. um, uh, helps kind of like uh, bring together some of the uh, some of the common, uh, I guess, I guess tasks and problems that we run into um, without elaborating too much. but. Uh, We'll get into uh, it. Yeah, yeah. So it's. I, I think it's right now. It's a little bit more of the human element, more of like a twenty-four-seven right. uh, kind of role. But yeah, I've been here for quite a bit, and uh, in fact, used to actually uh, shop in this mall a long time <laughs> ago. So yeah, that's that's something that's pretty neat. So this uh, our headquarters. We call it the castle because before it was our headquarters, it was the Windsor Park Mall. Uh, here in uh, Windcrest, Missouri, a little suburb of uh, Missouri. Texas. Texas. Yeah. I, I was up in Missouri last week. It stuck. Um, no, in Texas, Windcrest, Texas. And it feels like Texas. Outside. It does, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, we're in the air conditioning right now. Um, no, it, it was a mall, and the mall kind of went into disrepair, and uh, we were able to purchase the mall and, and to turn it into our uh, headquarters. So it's uh, uh, one of the largest acts of recycling, I think. So it's right. uh, it's great to have that. Um Nick, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, about yourself? Yeah, um, Nick Keekler. I've been at Rackspace for about six years now. Um, just hit my six year mark nice. last week, actually. Congrats. Um, originally, I started working at the the Slicehost offices okay. out of St. Louis, Missouri. Um, there you go. It's coming back around. Yeah, I moved down to San Antonio a couple mm -hmm. years ago, um, and I've been working on cloud stuff ever since I joined Rackspace. Um, public cloud specifically. Um, I work on a lot of automation, mm -hmm. monitoring, metrics, 
logging, a lot of the kind of backend stuff, a lot of tooling to help us run our public cloud. Yeah, that's great. I'm really excited to hear a little bit more about the tooling and automation. That's one of the things that I think are very uh, important is to be able to automate and do it over and over again. So, very, very good. And you came from SliceHost. Uh, were you a uh, were you part of SliceHost before they were acquired? Or? No, no, okay. after. After, yeah. yeah. But yeah, from that St. Louis office, and now you're here in uh, in San Antonio, yep. which is still in Texas, I think. So. I think <laughs> <we got that. laughs> All right, there we go. Well, good. Um, well, it's glad to have everybody assembled. Uh, I just want to uh, kind of uh, talk a little bit about uh, how we're going to uh, approach this. Just we're going to go through a couple of different uh, ideas around fleet management and how we take care of everything. And uh, if you're watching out there uh, on, on Facebook or YouTube or Periscope and you have a question, we'd be more than happy to answer that uh, here on on the uh, live show, uh, or if you're watching in the future, well, we'll answer it in the future. Um, but uh, you can do that in a couple of different ways. You can just drop a comment into uh, the YouTube or uh, Facebook or Periscope comment stream there. You can also hit us up on Twitter with the hashtag CloudQA, um, and uh, and we'll be more than happy to answer that question for you, and uh, our producers will throw that in so we can uh, get that answered. But uh, Drew, why don't you go ahead and get us kicked off here? Well, sure. Um, First of all, in talking about our fleet, the, the conversation is really around our public cloud. So we've got um, a pretty massive deployment of OpenStack um, that's, that's spread over a pretty large geo. And so um, let's, let's put some, uh, some context around what our fleet entails, uh, some of the, the size and scale of it. So um, uh, Vidav, how about you uh, give us uh, kind of the, the high level overview of, of the extent to which we're talking about here? Sure, sure. So um, our cloud servers products are really all of our cloud products in general, public cloud products in general, um, are divided into six distinct regions. So they, they exist in all of our production data centers. Um, in total, uh, we have a fleet of tens of thousands of servers spread across those regions. Um, I think one of them is actually getting very close to about the 10,000 mark all on its own. So that's pretty exciting. Wow. Um, and so in size, they range on the small end from a few hundred up to that one that's probably almost half of the fleet or 40% of the fleet. Um, every one of our, our regions has a, a variety of hardware types uh, that represent the different flavors we offer customers. Um, and we organize those into what we call cells. Uh, and we have anywhere from a handful of cells to, I think, one of our data centers actually is approaching about the 50 cell mark. Um, so it's pretty interesting uh, management challenges there. Uh, I, I haven't run the numbers in a while, but I know about a year ago I did a talk uh, at a conference, and I know at the time I w we were calculating somewhere well north of about 340,000 cores uh, and somewhere just over a petabyte of RAM. Uh, under OpenStack Nova management in our public cloud, so it's pretty exciting stuff. It's very exciting. It's quite the quite the skill there. And so you, you talked a little bit about uh, the fact that we have it subdivided into geographic regions, and there's um, a lot of granularity once you uh, start digging from the the six geographic locations down into some of those weeds and some of the specifics around the specifics amount of RAM and, and cores and those kinds of things, um, and Keeping it all straight and keeping it all uh, sane is a bit of a, a difficult undertaking, and that's where uh, that's where we're gonna really camp out today. Is what does it look like to to manage that? So let's talk a little bit about the needs. What are the um, the high level requirements to uh, to even come close to managing uh, something of this scale? A any and either of you. <laughs> sure, I think it first starts with um, just organizing all of our we call it inventory of our fleet. So all of our hosts that we have in the data center, we have to keep track of that somehow. We have developed a tool called Galaxy that that sources the data from a lot of other tools that we use like Core and IP Commander and mm -hmm. a lot of other internal services that that are the kind of source of truth of all the data we need. Um, so we put it in Galaxy and and then that allows us to kind of drill down to a region or um, a cell or just a single host kind of go from there. We have all of our switches and networking gear and hypervisors and um, organized by cabinets. And So just to be able to see everything in one place 
has got to go a long way rather than having to dig around and, and oh yeah and absolutely between different tools yeah. and when you say everything in one place uh, that in and of itself is a pretty big undertaking to to just be able to identify all of the physical hosts is useful but it's a lot more useful when you can associate that physical uh, host with all the networking components it's associated with and and drill into a lot of those more uh fine-grained components. There's a big difference between is this a production device? Is this something that we're getting prepped to put into production? Is it something that we've pulled from production to do work on? And being able to identify all of that makes interacting with it a lot easier. And and in scale uh, that we're talking about, it's a lot easier when you have all those things in front of you for one person to go in and make a big impact uh, for the positive. Uh, Instead of having you know an army of people who are, are tasked with you know go out there and, and fix the problem, find the problem, uh, etc. So uh, just consolidating all of this into one spot is is huge. So Galaxy uh, being a big part of that uh, allows us to very effectively and efficiently interact. Not just interact, but improve uh, what it is we have. Um, so that's. Uh, that's the, the first level. Uh, that's that's what uh, what we need is to know where everything is. Um, now we've got to figure out, you know, how do we execute tasks um, against that infrastructure? So uh, let's talk a little bit about what um, what kinds of things need to be done and how we made that easier uh, on on the people doing the work because yeah, we we want those people to be able to do as much as possible. There's there's a couple different ways that we kind of interact with our fleet. Um, so we have humans that interact with it, and for that we have uh, a web interface, a web app called O3 Alerts mm -hmm. um, that lets like our operations team kind of see all the alerts that are coming in for the fleet. Um, you can click on a server and see all the customer instances that are on it. Um, basically, you can see like the entire history of that server. So did we get any alerts for it? Um, all the customers that are on it, any kind of notes that our operations team has added, um, just a lot of different data about that. And so so the list of the hypervisor data comes from Galaxy, and then we pull other data from OpenStack services like OpenStack Nova for the compute, Glance for images, um, Neutron for IP-related stuff. So we're integrating a lot of different components. We're integrating things that anyone deploying OpenStack uh, would have. And then we're integrating things that are more proprietary to our approach to it. And we're bringing those all together in, in one platform so that those customer facing people who are talking with someone about, you know, I'm seeing this on my server. And in that case, it's a VM. Um, what's going on on the infrastructure and then having that be quickly accessible and uh, the context around that event being far more consumable because it, it would take substantially longer for a customer uh, to get answers if all of that had to be done manually pulled in the individual locations that it could potentially be in. And so we're, we're talking about these from a pretty high level, but the value that it derives our, our users, our customers, is that speed to resolution and speed to understanding, uh, being able to say very quickly, um, it's not 90% of the things that it could be, so uh, let's quickly start digging into these 10% of things that are the most likely at this point. Um, being able to, to sift that way is a huge, uh, huge component in speed of resolution. So well, we've talked a little bit about um, some of these things that we have. We've talked about some of the um, the core components. Um, automation is a big piece of this because uh, when we started our cloud with the slice host days, uh, the scale that we we're talking about was much different than it is today. We've got an enormous OpenStack deployment and uh, the implications of that um, kind of ripple through all of these different pieces. One of the big ones is the people to support it. Um, to do it well, you have a combination of the human interaction and the automation interaction. And so let's talk about some of the problems that we uh, we realized were there and some of the automation tools we brought forth to, uh, to deliver uh, easier and more repeatable solutions um, around some of those problems. I, th I think the big problem in my mind is that we're, we're able to scale our infrastructure faster than we can hire like awesome engineers, awesome operators for our public cloud. Um, yeah, we can 
we can buy servers all day long, but we we can't really like it's, it's hard to hire people. Like let's be honest, it's hard. It's tough to find the right people with the right knowledge to yeah. operate at what the scale of things... that we're operating at. Yeah, Bert, what types of things are we looking for in, in some of those operators? And if you're watching, maybe you're one of those people. So Right, right. So <clears throat> kind of to Nick's point, I think maybe we had, uh, we, we thought maybe we uh, we could kind of like, we could scale up, maybe we could even scale in terms of having an operations group rather. Um, I think in the uh, early on when it was mostly uh, just a lot of the slice house infrastructure, we thought, you know, we could we can staff up enough people, um, we can have 24-7 coverage in order to find the root cause or patterns that we identify, but as Nick mentioned, you can only have so many pairs of eyes uh, before you start to realize that you do need to begin some earnest efforts in tooling and be able to automate some of the um, more repetitive things that are coming up. But yeah, uh, so it is incredibly difficult to actually um, hire uh, talented people, talented folks uh, who are able to operate in that kind of an environment. One of the things that we see a lot is uh, we'll have a person get hired on um, and they've got to get up to speed. We may find the most talented person in the market that um, shows up, but they've got to actually um, start delivering value on the specific things that we've built. And one of the things that automation can do is expedite that um, that process of learning you know what's going on here because you can go and look and see okay here here are the uh, the templates that are being used here's what's actually going on you've got a reference uh, piece of material that is the environment it represents what's going on and having the tooling like galaxy you can go in and see at a, at a very high level um, here's everything and then dig in where you find uh, the specific issue that you want to look at or, or be educated on. And a lot of these tools make that uh, onboarding process substantially uh, more fluid instead of having, you know, years and years of, uh, of experience that the people who are on staff when that person is hired have, uh, you know, be, oh yeah, this is an edge case. Let me talk to you about it. Um, oh yeah, this is, this is something that uh, the guy down the, down the row knows the most about. Go talk to him about it. That could be a really painful learning process, but the more tooling you have in place that you can uh, refer to, the better that, um, that engagement can be and the quicker somebody can come up to speed and be ready to go. And that's something that um, we talk about for our cloud customers, but if you're dealing with a, a massive fleet management project, it can pay some huge dividends to have uh, the tools built out or be building those out so that when you bring somebody new on, they're much more quickly um, able to be helpful and understand the environment. So um, do you have any uh, any experiences bringing someone new on um, after having a lot of these tools built um, versus somebody bring, bring somebody new on before they were built? That, speak to that. Right. So that would probably be my perspective. Um, I remember uh, quite some time back, uh, I was I was fairly convinced that I would be able to um, get to, I, I would be able to kind of have this condition where I would be able to, I would be able to, as a human being, finally fix the things by the end of the day. And the reality was that the more I threw myself at that, and the more that folks that worked with us um, tried to work around that, um, it became obvious that, like Nick said, we were scaling um, at a very rapid rate. And so um, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but if I have worked through a problem, I've grabbed through logs, you know, for months at a time, or I'm, I'm, I'm actively involved in trying to get down to a root cause and just get something out of the way. Maybe it's vendor specific. I would much rather have something to click on or to just work with a very efficient tool and get it done if we know what the problem is. If it's a larger scale problem, well, obviously we're gonna to have to engage other teams, right, um, for a long-term resolution. But some of the smaller things, you know, um, maybe it's as uh, simple as a, as a drive failure or a uh, component failure, you know, uh, but we wanna be able to get beyond that as quickly as possible and not have to necessarily spend a tremendous amount of, uh, of human time, you know, uh, tracking down the issue. So uh, more to the onboarding um, effect, yeah. I think a lot of the folks uh, who uh, engage in this kind of role are, um, they're kind of, uh, I, I think they want to kind of exert like their investigative skills at first, um, especially if you come from outside of rec space. Mm -hmm. um, there are folks who are still trying to figure out what all the moving parts are, um, and then the complexity, you know, layered onto that. And uh, it's difficult to, to get a grasp for it. Um, I've been here, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I'm starting my ninth year, and there are, there are some things that still confound me. 
So uh, it's no easy process for sure. We're trying to define it as an operations team so that we can make sure that talented folks who actually join us um, and the rest of our groups are able to uh, to kind of transition into that role as quickly as possible and be able to uh, offer the most help that they can uh, while not being bogged down necessarily with, uh, with a bunch of the obscurity and some of the other stuff we deal with. So I don't know if that helps answer your questions. So. No, that, that is helpful. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that, that you see, so we're trying to approach uh, why are we going to implement this new thing, this new tool, why are we going to build this um, from a, you know, find, notice, noticing pain, identifying pain. And uh, we've already talked a little bit about just the difficulty of getting everything into one place. Once we have a tool, it's much easier. Um, there are plenty of other uh, parts of our infrastructure, problems that we ran into where we said, you know, this would be a lot easier if we could just uh, let the robots do it. You know, build build an automation tool that can handle this. Um, and we talked about the infrastructure scaling at the pace that it does, and part of that is aided by the work that's been done to deploy resources in an automated way, let the cloud grow itself. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that, what it looks like to um, to handle deployment of new resources in an automated way to, to take that burden and workload uh, more uh, off of the human back and put it on the, the, the robotic back. Okay, so we have... Um... Under the hood, we use a lot of open source tooling like Ansible and obviously OpenStack. Um, you mentioned earlier like onboarding new people. I, I think it helps us when we use open source tooling. There's already a big community and a lot of documentation for people to mm -hmm. reference. Um, so, so a lot of our like playbooks for building out infrastructure and even a lot of our automation like um, solving problems or doing things automatically, we're using Ansible um, and kind of wrapping uh, Ansible into our larger automation framework. Uh, so to say like build a cell, we have a couple playbooks that we run that will uh, build our control plane, the, all the servers we need to kind of power the new cell. Um, another playbook to kick and bootstrap all the hypervisors that will kind of house all the customer data in that cell. Um, a playbook that adds all the monitoring. So like humans don't really need to do all this stuff. Um, we kind of just need to oversee that everything is accurate and correct. Kind of double check it. And we, all, we also automate kind of the, the QE processes um, just yeah, we can kind of almost automate everything we need to do. Well, you mentioned Ansible as one of the things. Uh, Matt, uh, uh, up there on the uh, operator side of things, I mean, it seems like uh, OpenStack as a whole is kind of using a lot of Ansible. I know that uh, Rackspace uses a lot of Ansible to get things set up. Matt, what's your perspective on that, uh, on using Ansible with, uh, with OpenStack? Um, yeah, there is quite a bit of Ansible use overall. I mean, um, you know, our Rackspace private cloud folks sort of brought uh, their OpenStack Ansible deployment utilities to the community, and it's been picked up by quite a few folks. Um, from a general config management standpoint, you actually see a lot of it. You see plenty of folks who still use Puppet or still use Chef, um, and there's, there's a growing number of Ansible uh, folks as well. You know, I think for us, um, the decision to, to go down the Ansible path is really kind of a philosophy decision, and I know that sounds weird, but... Um, you know, these guys have talked a lot about sort of the challenges with scale, and there's really two sort of fundamental problems with, with the size that we've gotten to. One is the macro, and that is, you know, if someone came to me several years ago and said, hey, Matt, you're going to run infrastructure, and most of your problems are going to be 0.1% problems, I'd have been like, all right, that's awesome, right? You know, 99.9%, .9%, no big deal, except when you start thinking about some of our regions, a 0.1% problem can still translate to hundreds, if not thousands of instances, right? So these are customers' businesses that are impacted by what's essentially an edge case. So at the macro level, you know, Ansible and automations like that allow us to try to take the 99.9% .9 stuff and get it out of the way of the really smart people on Bert's teams and other teams like his so they can go work on the 0.1% problems, right? The stuff that's going to take someone digging in. It's a new issue. It's something we hadn't seen before. It's an odd thing. So that's the macro. Then there's kind of the, I can't call it the micro, but kind of the complexity of an individual node has grown over time as well. Um, 
And so if you think about an, an individual hypervisor, just by the time you talk about the hypervisor version and the version of OpenStack code running on it and the firmware for the host and the, you know, the myriad of other things that are involved in making it sort of functioning, um, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendously complex uh, set of variables that you can make the decision up front to either troubleshoot every little issue down to the nth degree, or you can accept that one of those variables may not be of the current version or maybe the cause. And so can you move towards a model where you sort of shoot first and ask questions later? Uh, and I can't even say that we're there with every one of our hosts today, but that's something we're striving for. And I think that's really what drove the thought behind Ansible. When we stood back and looked at it, we said, if we were going to treat this like a web app and not infrastructure, how could we make things expendable, provided we had a solid inventory and we had a way to, to, to sort of uh, define the, the fleet? How could we approach configuration management as of we're always kind of starting from a new thing? Uh, because then that changes the way that we actually look at not only how we, how we configure new stuff, but how we handle problems. Um, and so, like I said, it's still an evolution. Uh, I, think, I think Nick and Bert can both tell you we're nowhere near where we want to be. But it was, it was thinking about those things in that way that sort of drove us down the path of a configuration management that's very friendly to sort of the initial setup approach is the way I would describe it. Uh, and that could be oversimplifying Ansible, but um, that, that's kind of how we started it. That's great. That's, um, that's, that's some good insight there. Um, you you kind of mentioned this idea of starting from fresh. Um, what about uh, healing architecture as it's going along? Do you have anything working for self-healing? I know that's a, you mentioned this web app kind of approach. Is that something that we're looking at to steal from web apps, kind of a self-healing architecture? Absolutely. Um, and, and there's a couple different things that we can self-heal. There's the control plane and the data plane. So let's talk about the data plane. With um, SenseOver 6.2, we can live migrate instances around. So say we detect some problem on a hypervisor um, that, that we know might be bad for customers. So like in the future, they'll probably have a problem. If we can detect that problem, we can live migrate the customers off, disable the host, um, maybe run some tests or re-kick it into the latest version of Zen server or, or deploy the latest version of code to it. Um, we can essentially remove the maybe faulty or problematic machine out of rotation without impacting anybody. Um, and maybe we need to have DC apps take a look. We can't really automate that part yet, <laughs> maybe in the future. With control plane, we can do the same thing. Like with load balancers, we can pop a node out of the load balancers so no requests are hitting it. Um, just delete it and rebuild it, start, start over from scratch. And so you've got automation tools in place that can uh, repeatedly deploy the most stable version, and you've got monitoring in place that can understand all of the, the variants and then where... Maybe not all, um, but but a big portion of it. I mean, we still need to get better with... There's just so many different things to monitor. Mm -hmm. We monitor a lot of different things, um, like basic stuff like disk usage or whatever, um, but also like like our APIs. Are our APIs responding correctly? Like are we hitting 99.99%? Um, a lot of maybe infrastructure things that are harder to monitor as well. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know that we're monitoring everything that we want to be monitoring or the way we want to monitor it, but we're working towards it. That's always a progression that you're working towards. There's, uh, we had a show a while back with uh, somebody in our data analytics uh, organization, Robert Chapa, and he was talking about uh, using a monitoring tool, and he had set up some specific things to look for, and then um, discovered that if he added a few more variables, he would get a clear picture, and then a few more variables, he got an even better picture. And he used a tool on purpose so that he could define all of the things that he would want to potentially monitor. And using that uh, has delivered, he has some very specific uh, deliverables that he um, he spoke to and, and described, and so you can go check that show out if you'd like. But having a big infrastructure with all of these potential variables, uh, we done talked to, um, just a few of them with uh, having you know, versions of Xen and versions of uh, kernel and all the stuff. You've got vendors and, and all of these potential impactful uh, components. 
And uh, the more you can know and the more you can watch, the clearer picture and the more quickly um, that you know, 0.001% issue um, is very highlighted. Okay, there's the problem and there's the, the variable that's the same with them that isn't the same with these others. So let's jump into that and make those, those changes and make those um, upgrades. With automation, you've got a repeatable way to quickly go in and say, okay, we know that this is a stable version. We're identifying as we're going that this may not be as stable. So let's get this stuff um, pivoted into this new, um, more stable approach, yep. um, which is huge. Uh, let's talk about what monitoring we do have and how we're, we're using that to uncover um, ways to improve. Sure, we use uh, Nagios monitoring system. It's open source, it's been around forever. Um, but inside of that, we use a lot of plugins, like custom Nagios plugins we've written over the years that do a lot of different things. And our, our Nagios actually hooks into a couple other systems like Graphite for metrics, Elasticsearch for pretty much any other kind of non-time series data. Um, what do we monitor? A lot of different things on hypervisors. Um, we monitor that all of our APIs are, are just responding, like is Nova API service running? And then we monitor is no API service working? So we make a request and look at the response and make sure it's giving us like mm -hmm. a known good response. Um, we do that with all of our OpenStack services. Um, we monitor a lot of different things. Yeah. So we I mean, we do build testing too, which I I think has caught a lot of a lot of the edge cases Matt mentioned earlier. Um, like we we kick off build tests for a lot of our like base images every couple minutes, make sure it builds. Um, if it doesn't build, we know we need to kind of look at maybe that cell or that hypervisor and and see what's going on. And with with a logical monitoring approach, you can quickly kind of rule out some of the potential problems when you see not only is the first monitor going off, but this more granular monitor is going off too. Okay, well that rules some things out and I can more quickly resolve this issue, which um, again is a, a delivery of value to our end users, our, our customers. Um, we can quickly find, you know, okay, let's not uh, build that new image in this area. We can make some changes um, so that our users can have a, a useful server uh, deployed. And part of that is um, is handling, you know, where are these builds going, directing a lot of that traffic. And um, there's a lot of tooling in that as well. Um, let's talk a little bit about where, um, where we're uh, kind of doing some of that traffic direction so that we can get customers the results they want and address issues that we see as they're kind of evolving. What do you mean by traffic direction? Well, as we're um, utilizing our infrastructure and as users are submitting requests, I want to build a server. Um, we know, okay, we've got some resources. X number of capacity. Yeah. yeah, we have. We've added some stuff to OpenStack upstream. I don't know if it made it into upstream. Um, that allows us to disable a cell for build. So if we if we have any kind of maybe a maintenance for some like chunk of that cell, we can disable the cells so that no new build will land on it. Um, say the cell might be getting like low on capacity and we need to add more or, or whatever, we can disable the cell so that no customers will land in it. And I know we've added some of that functionality into upstream OpenStack. We've been trying to get it in for quite a while and I think some of it just landed within the past year. Um, but yeah, Using cells allows us to kind of distribute between um, distribute load between the regions or within a region, um, and then perform maintenances or upgrade tasks within a cell by disabling it. So, yeah, since you're um, kind of there with a lot of the operators talking about uh, what other people are doing at scale with OpenStack, um, how is that? Uh, thought leadership that Rackspace is exhibiting, having such a gigantic uh, deployment. Uh, what are some of those conversations around um, us contributing what we've learned forward and some of the philosophy that we've taken of let's subdivide this in a certain way. And um, I know 
uh, cells was kind of a, a piece of that early uh, philosophy that we adopted. Um, what other things are you kind of seeing in the, the broader OpenStack ecosystem? Yeah, so, you know, so clearly overall Rackspace has a really interesting position um, in the community, and not just as contributors from a code perspective, but, you know, um, we do run one of the largest deployments out there. Uh, and so we do get asked to kind of bring that perspective uh, in a number of ways. Uh, one of them that's kind of near and dear to my heart is uh, within the operator community, there's actually a group called the Large Deployments Team. Uh, and this is specifically operators who um, who run cloud at scale. And we, we, we're pretty loose with the term scale. We understand not, you know, the scale means different things to different people. But when you start looking at some of the other active members of that group, you have people like CERN over in, in Europe, you know, doing the particle collisions. And, um, you know, our friends at GoDaddy have been actively involved in several issues the team's been working on. Uh, the, the Nectar folks, the research cloud down in Australia have been very uh, involved. And others are coming uh, and joining quite a bit. So that's one place where, uh, as Rackspace, we take our experiences. And actually what we find there is, you know, people are running into some of the same issues and, and they're dealing with some of the same problems. Uh, and so collectively, as operators, we've been able to take those problems and, and present them in a way to different dev teams uh, that have actually already driven results. Uh, we've seen some some code land and Neutron specifically from the team's work um, that, that benefited a number of, of operators. I think additionally, um, you know, people just like to ask, hey, how are you doing this? Or, or can you tell us um, how you survived this nightmare? And we, we love to share those those kind of stories in, informally. Uh, and then I think the most recent way is is really, um, it's not our team directly, but a lot of these tools we're talking about, all the things that we've done in the public cloud, have sort of inspired Rackspace to, and Intel uh, through our OSIC partnership to actually put resources behind developing upstream fleet management tooling, right? So uh, that group has largely been focused on um, inventory so far, but we'll obviously bring, be bringing them a lot of the things we've done around automation here soon so they can take that into account as well. Uh, but that's actually a conversation that's going to happen tomorrow afternoon here at the, the operator's mid-cycle. There'll be a whole session just on fleet management in Creighton, which is the upstream project name. Uh, and that's a, that was very largely pushed by Rackspace out of sort of what we've learned from scale. Uh, and I think internally for us, uh, you know, we're going to have to look at those exact same things and start thinking about them in terms of our private cloud offering. Right? Whereas public cloud scale means a lot of hosts, um, private cloud scale may mean a lot of clouds. And so what, what things are common and what things are different and how do we um, take what we've learned and apply that uh, in, in an exciting way. And I think that that's something that that uh, will be our challenge, uh, along with finishing all of our big grandiose ideas around automation and things for the public cloud. I think those are the challenges ahead of us um, for the next couple of years, for sure. Well, thanks. It's uh, it's good to get uh, kind of the larger, broader perspective uh, to have more um, more insight into what the rest of the market is doing. Having having a large scale deployment um, is convenient for us. Uh, it's inconvenient because it's enormous and, and, and very complex. But being um, out there on the the front edge uh, of what people are doing uh, gives us insight where we can um, we can deliver that to our customers internally as they're deploying their own private clouds. And OpenStack is maturing. That's kind of the theme you continue to hear as you go to summits and you hear back from people who are are using uh, this maturing product and, and we're able to be a big part of uh, seeing that mature and um, having other large players like Intel for with OSIC and having uh, CERN. We talked with uh, Tim Bell during the London, uh, not Paris, Paris uh, OpenStack Summit, and he was talking about the, the petabytes and petabytes of data that they're generating uh, in a year and being able to handle all this stuff um, well and sanely and with uh, the same team that they started doing this with um, is really interesting. And the more different organizations are, are piling in uh, their lessons learned and the ways they've um, approached the problems that they've run into uh, just goes to help the, the end customer more. It goes to make a, a better experience for them. And so our, our public cloud consumers don't get to see uh, the all the, the sweat and the work that's going on behind the scenes to, uh, to make our infrastructure uh, 
run smoothly and um, to keep those edge cases from really swelling into bigger deals. Um, with such a big infrastructure, let's talk a little bit about the, the auditing process, uh, about making sure that it's all um, running the way we expect it to run, being um, synced up with itself um, and through Auditor. And let's talk a little bit about what that looks like. Yeah, Auditor is a, a tool we, we made. It's We have two tools, Resolver, which is our automation, and, and Auditor, which is um, the auditing aspect. And they're kind of like sibling tools. They, they work pretty closely together. Um, so Auditor, we have, uh, it's a plugin system, so we can make different plugins for whatever we want to audit. Um, so let's take hypervisor version, for example. So we can, um, we have like the known hypervisor version that we want. If a host doesn't match that version, we can, Auditor will detect it, and then it kicks off a task to Resolver saying like, hey, I need you to migrate customers off, um, re-kick the host, install this like known good version, and run some tests and put it back in rotation. So, so Auditor, it just looks at our fleet um, for whatever we tell it to look at, and uh, a lot of the time we'll, we'll kind of hook it into Resolver to do whatever we need it to do to get it to that known good point. Well, it sounds like a lot of this is, is coming together, right? I mean, Bert, we've been talking about um, the different ways that we can do some of the live migrations off of, um, you, know, you know, live patching and everything like that, and we can look at the entire inventory, we can look at the, uh, we can audit it to see how it is, we can live migrate them off to another place, and then we can uh, upgrade it and have that ready to go for the next one. I mean, is, is that kind of where we're going, trying to put everything together? So, yeah, and, um, <clears throat> well, uh, maybe necessarily a small part of some of that identification early on. Um, there are uh, eyes that initially identify, you know, some of the problems that mm -hmm. we will ultimately turn into automation attempts. Um, and a lot of that involves folks on, in an operations role. Um, so our what we see on a daily basis or a nightly basis, um, we bubble up uh, and eventually get that in into some form of an automated response, if we can do it, if we mm -hmm. can do it. Um, but some of the problems based on the layers of complexity, uh, you had mentioned uh, earlier, Drew, um, some of the uh, differences in uh, vendor-specific uh, hardware or perhaps, uh, you know, it's it sky's the limit uh, where it comes to complexity. But um, at some point, a human tends to um, interpret that, and then yeah. they have to be able to pass that back up or make a decision. Um, but that's some of the early stuff, and it's it's mostly evolving. Uh, I think what Nick is speaking to is over time, some of the issues that we've found um, to be uh, fairly easily identifiable or have uh, resulted from the efforts of others in the past, definitely something that we don't want to continue to hammer on, yeah. you know, for the, for the next month or year or whatever. So. I was looking for places to offload work. Uh, make it... Make it uh, a robot doing that task, make mm -hmm. it automation that can um, achieve that end goal so that you can focus on uh, making that 0.00001% of the infrastructure that has the problem instead of 0.01. As you move that decimal, mm -hmm. you're able to impact fewer and fewer customers, and we're scaling um, the amount of resources that we offer. So you've got uh, one number with a decimal place moving in one direction, and our hopeful end state is to move the problematic and a decimal point the other direction until um, customers are not being impacted and the cloud is running itself. I think it's so one of the one of the curious things is it's it's kind of like an interesting race. Uh, you end up having this situation where uh, you know maybe you've identified some novel uh, issue you know within the public cloud, and um, as a human, your inclination is you know to spot the spot the problem, spot the cause, and then maybe see you know how per, how pervasive it is. Uh, start thinking in terms of how I want to have something fix this and not necessarily have to respond to this every time. But having been through this uh, for several years, uh, the funny thing is, is that I think I kind of challenged myself and maybe some folks in an operations role do too, uh, that they might be able to get ahead of it before they can actually automate it. And so when you realize you're kind of hitting that curve and you're, no matter how many people you may want to throw at this or how many, uh, you know, how many individual attempts uh, in order to get it out of the way, uh, you realize in the end that you do have to embrace the automation. And if you don't, um, it's going to be in a lot of long hours. And there's some uh, transitional differences, too. Um, just because, uh, let's say, in an operations role, you're looking at, at, at some new or novel problem, uh, you may have fully understood that by the end of so many hours. but 
um, being able to provide that 24-7 coverage um, and basically eyes on problems, the next person may not be able to, or it may not necessarily be communicated uh, from one human to the next. If we can get it into a fairly dry, logical representation of what we want to do, that, in my opinion, is definitely where we want to move. So it's just initially identifying some of these problems with all of the moving parts is difficult. Yeah. Well, we don't have robots writing the code yet either, so the Not humans yet. have to figure out what to code against. Yep. And yeah, so that, that's I think that's a good thing. I think we're kind of all in agreement about that for now. But uh, uh, yeah, we don't want the robots to to uprise. Uh, at least not for a while. We well, do want to be self-healing and self-provisioning, but self-aware becomes uh, problematic. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't know. I challenge I I challenge the guys regularly to ask him, can we take it so far that the cloud's able to order its own gear? <laughs> so so there's can. a level of there's a level of self awareness that we joke about. But I mean, you're right. Like there's always more we can do. And I think sometimes we, you know, get caught up in, oh, we still don't have this thing automated, or we still don't have this process completely hands free, or we still don't have, um, you know, these th seven things that we want. But we kind of have to stop uh, and remind ourselves what we have done, uh, because, you know, if we look at some of the things that we were doing two years ago, even. Um, the amount of work that went into even provisioning a new host was remarkably different than it is today. So they, they are interesting and, and, and fun questions to pose to ourselves because even if we don't get all the way there, uh, I think getting you know a good portion of the way there is still a huge win. Well, all joking aside, I mean, it would, to my mind, seem beneficial to be able to order more hardware as you, as you need it. I mean, you could uh, keep inputting demand and, and, and things like that and demand and capacity and kind of figure out where you're at and... Uh, you know, hey, maybe we should get there and, and get to that point. Well, I think uh, what you're talking about really speaks to the the philosophy that Rackspace has approached our fleet with. Um, looking at any place that you can uh, you can automate something, and any any situation that you could make um, easier on uh, the people who are putting their backs to the problem, um, that's. That's an approach that I think is really necessary for anybody who's got a large fleet that they've got to manage. Um, a lot of our customers and a lot of the public cloud customers, their fleet are a bunch of VMs and they have to look at them um, with that lens. Uh, but managing, we have customers that are in every single data center on, um, on various products and who are using um, the the full force of Rackspace's public cloud, and they have a fleet management problem um, of their own. How do we how do we approach this uh, in a way that we can logically separate what's going on um, in this tier of our infrastructure and in this tier of our infrastructure? And we've brought a uh, an automation mindset and an approach of how can we have a minimally impactful change made so that our customers can keep doing what they need to do, and we can keep providing a more um, a more steady, solid, and high-performance environment for them. Um, and with those philosophies, uh, you can pretty much approach any any problem of how can um, how do we address this? Okay, well, we want it to be minimally impactful for our users, and we want to do it with the least amount of manual intervention moving forward. We want to build it so that it can take care of itself in the future. Um, and those tenants have helped us approach problems as they come up. And for any, any organization approaching fleet management, uh, thinking through that philosophy of how are we gonna approach this um, is important and it may not look exactly the same way for, for them that it does uh, for us, but building a tool um, as massive as our public cloud uh, requires a bunch of little decisions that are made of let's, let's make this easier, let's make this cleaner, let's make this faster so that our customers are impacted as minimally as possible. Um, and so we're seeing uh, things that have come a really long way. We've, we've had um, situations in the past that um, could have impacted our customers uh, recently that didn't because we've built products and projects and we've built tooling to really keep that um, out of the, the impactful realm, make that more and more uh, seamless. And as our customers uh, continue to ask, we just don't want to be impacted by, by anything. We know hardware fails. I don't want to ever feel it fail. Um, we're getting to, to a point where we can see this uh, problem crop up before it becomes an issue, get all those customers vacated and move so that we can address that infrastructure. And that is a huge, uh, a huge step. It's something that uh, people have asked for for a long time, customers want. Um, 
but it's becoming a reality as we get better and better at uh, forecasting and about seeing, you know, uh, with monitoring, this is what's going on. Um, and a lot of that is, is coming down to visualization is something that uh, we want to kind of close with is how do we look at um, this environment? How do we know um, what's going on out there so that we can identify problems before they become too painful and get them addressed? I'd say we have two tools that we use the most for visualizing everything. Um, O3 alerts kind of gives us like a, a detailed view. Um, I, I prefer to use Elasticsearch and Kibana. So I'm um, one of my personal projects that I was interested in. I took all the data in Galaxy, all of our hosts, all of our um, like cabs and switches and all that data. And I dumped it into Elasticsearch and visualized it with Kibana. So I can, um, I did the same thing with all of our all of our alerts. So every alert we get is going into Kibana. So let's take alerts for example. I can see all the alerts that are in a region or um, all, all the alerts for a certain like type of service and see all the hosts that have had that alert. Um, we can see the trends over time. Kibana is so powerful. We can kind of drill down or drill up and and just slice the data in a lot of different ways. And um, let's not forget that some of that work has also benefited us um, and the operations group as well, because we were able to identify with a certain level of granularity timelines for emerging incidents, um, which yep. uh, in the past has not always been so easy. Yeah. Well, the, the human mind is fantastic at identifying patterns and noticing outliers. And when you have a good visualization tool that you can quickly pull up and then at a glance um, identify, look, there's something going on here. I'm not sure what it is yet, but there's clearly something happening. Let's get more information on that. And being able to drill down um, quickly can help us be in front of a problem before the, the impact is felt. And so that's uh, that's a huge uh, component to uh, managing something pretty, uh, pretty large. I agree. I'm still trying to figure out how we might automate that, um, the kind of automated detailed analysis that, that humans are able to do is super hard to automate right now without um, like AI and, and deep learning and machine learning type of aspects. Which, which are all we're working uh, on it, technologies. Though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so. we're working on it. Yeah. Well, well very cool. Um, this conversation, we've kind of stayed relatively broad, just touching on some of the different pockets that we've uh, built automation and approached our massive scale with. Um, and you guys do a lot more on a day-to-day -day basis than what we've been able to talk about. We haven't drilled uh, terribly deep into any of these things. But um, fleet management is something that everyone deals with, even if they're um, you know, a simple app with a couple of servers, uh, knowing how to, to code version and knowing how to, to move their environment forward with the technologies that are, are evolving, something that, that everyone has to deal with. Um, we have the the luxury of having a lot of experience. Um, a billion with, hours. Uh, yeah, so we, we crossed the billion hour mark a few weeks ago with uh, hours of OpenStack VMs running or something along. I'm not sure the exact uh, nomenclature that was used, but a massive amount of, uh, of experience dealing with a massive infrastructure, and that gets delivered as value to our customers, and, and it continues to improve. We continue to find a new and better ways to approach that, and that gets delivered back to our customers in the private cloud world and the OpenStack world, uh, the other people using um, the same technologies and wanting to know how to, to better approach what they're approaching. So thank you guys for, for coming and giving us uh, that look into what it is we're doing for the work that you do on a daily basis. Uh, thanks, VW, for uh, representing us uh, at the operators group and um, being being a part of uh, running this this massive deployment that we've got going. Thank you. Hey, my, my pleasure. Yeah. No, the credit really goes to the guys you have sitting with you. I'm just the lucky guy who gets to take care of that. So. Well, I think we've got some uh, some further conversations to have down the road. So as uh, as we continue doing these shows every Thursday, um, be on the lookout. You may see some of these faces again. Um, but that's uh, that's kind of what we're gonna what we're gonna plan to do. It won't be next week, but um, as we go through the the remainder of the year and as we continue forward, uh, check us out on all the platforms on the Periscopes and Facebook Lives and YouTubes. Um, 
reach out to us on Twitter. Uh, we're always happy to, to engage and interact. If you've got questions, uh, we'd love to, to help answer them and, and have that conversation. Um, if you have a specific uh, issue you need resolved, uh, reach out to your, your support people. Um, they're happy to, to get into what that might be and how we might uh, help you uh, deliver against those problems as ideally as possible. So thanks for joining us, uh, all of you guests and all the viewers, and uh, we'll be back on Thursday with more.